Preface B of A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Hoffman. Latin text recorded by Mr. Martin Giessen. A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life by William Law. Preface B. North Crawley, February 6th, 1772. Sir, I peruse the letter signed Oranius in your paper with that cordial complacency which every faithful steward must feel from observing the furtherance of his master's interest, and I devoutly wish that every other fellow laborer was as assiduous in sowing the good seed as the enemy seems in sowing the tares. But, while I approve and applaud Arrhenius's zeal in recommending that excellent practical summary of Christian duty, the serious call, I seem to regret the limitation of it to that treatise alone, when to me it appears that a serious attention to those sublime tracts of the same divinely illuminated writer, the spirit of prayer, and the spirit of love, would be productive of at least equal advantages especially at a season when the serpent is winding about insinuating his deadly poison in arrogant illustrations and anti-christian family bibles to know whom we worship to entertain proper notions of god is the first necessary principle of true religion and these volumes are calculated to convey such exalted and amiable ideas of god and to unfold in so rational and delightful a manner the great mysteries of redemption and regeneration, that whoever peruses them with candor and attention, will find in them a perfect key to the Holy Scriptures, having, if I may be allowed the sacred language, the glory of God and His light, like unto a stone most precious, clear as crystal. And, beside informing his understanding, if they do not elevate his heart to an exalted pitch of love and devotion to his great benefactor, and cause it to overflow in streams of grateful benevolence to all mankind, he must be among those obdurate insensibles who need our pity and our prayers. The happy effects here promised are not the mere speculative conjectures of fancy, for I have only described what were my own feelings upon the same occasion, and I will further venture to declare that i received more light and satisfaction from the perusal of these little volumes than i had been able to extract from many volumes of letter-learned commentators darkened illustrations and bodies of divinity which i had before carefully read with the same temper and desire i am so far in the same unfortunate predicament with arrhenius never to have enjoyed the blessedness of that holy man's conversation but i have it well authenticated that he faithfully practised what he taught in burkett's words that he was a preaching life as well as a preaching doctrine and that pious disregard and contempt of the riches and honours of the world which he so pathetically recommends to others himself eminently displayed in refusing some of the best preferments in the bishop of london's gift when proffered by his friend dr sherlock in reward of the unanswerable letters to the bishop of bangor the charge of methodism i never heard insinuated against him and could proceed only from those who must be totally ignorant of the tenets of that sect or unacquainted with any among the writings of our able defender of church discipline and authority and especially of the last except one on justification by faith and works but not to leave myself liable to reprehension for the partiality i have noticed in another I am persuaded that whoever has imbibed knowledge at this pure fountain will never cease thirsting while there remains a drop of the sacred spring untasted, and that every scrip of that divinely directed pen may be as extensive as was the writer's benevolence, is the ardent prayer of your sincere well-wisher, Theophilus Z. Cousins. The following are the author's letter to a friend. Letter 1. Worthy and dear sir, my heart embraces you with all the tenderness and affection of Christian love, and I earnestly beg of God to make me a messenger of his peace to your soul. You seem to apprehend I may be much surprised at the account you have given of yourself, 
but, sir, I am neither surprised nor offended at it. I neither condemn nor lament your state, but shall endeavor to shew you how soon it may be made a blessing and happiness to you, in order to which I shall not enter into a consideration of the different kinds of trouble you have set forth at large. I think it better to lay before you the one true ground and root from whence all the evil and disorders of human life have sprung. This will make it easy for you to see what that is, which must and only can be the full remedy and relief for all of them, how different soever, either in kind or degree. The Scripture has assured us that God made man in his own image and likeness, a sufficient proof that man, in his first state, as he came forth from God, must have been absolutely free from all vanity, want, or distress of any kind from anything, either within or without him. It would be quite absurd and blasphemous to suppose that a creature, beginning to exist in the image and likeness of God, should have a vanity of life or vexation of spirit. A godlike perfection of nature, and a painful distressed nature, stand in the utmost contrariety to one another. Again, the scripture has assured us that man that is born of a woman hath but a short time to live, and is full of misery. Therefore, man now is not that creature that he was by his creation. The first divine and godlike nature of Adam, which was to have been immortally holy in union with God, is lost, and, instead of it, a poor mortal of earthly flesh and blood, born like a wild ass's colt, of a short life, and full of misery, is, through a vain pilgrimage, to end in dust and ashes. Therefore, let every evil, whether inward or outward, only teach you this truth, that man has infallibly lost his first divine life in God, and that no possible comfort or deliverance is to be expected, but only in this one thing, that though man had lost his God, yet God has become man, that man may be again alive in God, as at his first creation. For all the misery and distress of human nature, whether of body or mind, is wholly owing to this one cause, that God is not in man, nor man in God, as the state of his nature requires. It is because man has lost that first life of God in his soul, in and for which he was created. He lost this light, and spirit, and life of God, by turning his will, imagination, and desire, into a tasting and sensibility of the good and evil of this earthly, bestial world. Now, here are two things raised up in man, instead of the life of God. First, self, or selfishness, brought forth by his choosing to have a wisdom of his own, contrary to the will and instruction of his Creator. Secondly, an earthly, bestial, mortal life and body, brought forth by his eating that food, which was poison to his paradisiacal nature. But these must, therefore, be removed, that is, a man must first totally die to self, and all earthly desires, views, and intentions, before he can be again in God, as his nature and first creation requires. But now, if this be a certain and immutable truth, that man, so long as he is a selfish, earthly-minded creature, must be deprived of his true life, the life of God, the spirit of heaven in his soul, then how is the face of things changed? For then, what life is so much to be dreaded as a life of worldly ease and prosperity? What a misery, nay, what a curse, is there in everything that gratifies and nourishes our self-love? self-esteem, and self-seeking. On the other hand, what a happiness is there in all inward and outward troubles and vexations when they force us to feel and know the hell that is hidden within us, and the vanity of everything without us, when they turn our self-love into self-abhorrence and force us to call upon God to save us from ourselves, to give us a new life, new light, and new spirit in Christ Jesus. O oh, happy famine, might the poor prodigal have well said, which by reducing me to the necessity of asking to eat husks with swine, brought me to myself, 
and caused my return to my first happiness in my father's house. Now, sir, I will suppose your distressed state to be as you represent it, inwardly darkness, heaviness, and confusion of thoughts and passions, outwardly ill usage from friends, relations, and all the world, unable to strike up the least spark of light or comfort by any thought or reasoning of your own. O oh, happy famine! which leaves you not so much as the husk of one human comfort to feed upon. For, my dear friend, this is the time and place for all that good and life and salvation to happen to you which happened to the prodigal son. Your way is as short and your success as certain as his was. You have no more to do than he had. You need not call out for books and methods of devotion, for, in your present state, much reading and borrowed prayers are not your best method. All that you are to offer to God, all that is to help you to find Him to be your Savior and Redeemer, is best taught and expressed by the distressed state of your heart. Only let your present and past distress make you feel and acknowledge this twofold great truth. First, that in and of yourself you are nothing but darkness, vanity, and misery. Secondly, that of yourself, you can no more help yourself to light and comfort than you can create an angel. People, at all times, can seem to assent to these two truths, but then it is an assent that has no depth or reality, and so is of little or no use. But your condition has opened your heart for a deep and full conviction of these truths. Now give way, I beseech you, to this conviction, and hold these two truths in the same degree of certainty as you know two and two to be four. And then, my dear friend, you are, with the prodigal, come to yourself, and above half your work is done. Being now in the full possession of these two truths, feeling them in the same degree of certainty as you feel your own existence, you are under this sensibility to give yourself absolutely and entirely to God in Christ Jesus, as into the hands of infinite love, firmly believing this great and infallible truth, that God has no will towards you but that of infinite love and infinite desire to make you a partaker of His divine nature, and that it is as absolutely impossible for the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ to refuse you all that good and life and salvation which you want as it is for you to take it by your own power. O oh, sir, drink deep of this cup, for the precious water of eternal life is in it. Turn unto God with this faith, cast yourself into this abyss of love, and then you will be in that state the prodigal was in, when he said, I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son, and all that will be fulfilled in you which is related of him. Make this, therefore, the twofold exercise of your heart, now bowing yourself down before God in the deepest sense and acknowledgment of your own nothingness and vileness, then, looking up to God in faith and love, consider Him as always extending the arms of His mercy towards you, and full of an infinite desire to dwell in you as He dwells in the angels in heaven. Content yourself with this inward and simple exercise of your heart for a while, and seek, or like nothing in any book, but that which nourishes and strengthens this state of your heart. Come unto me, says the holy Jesus, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Here, my dear friend, is more for you to live upon, more light for your mind, more of unction for your heart than in volumes of human instructions. Pick up the words of the Holy Jesus, and beg of Him to be the light and life of your soul. Love the sound of His name, for Jesus is the love, the sweetness, the meekness, the compassionate goodness of the Deity itself, which became man, that so men might have power to become the sons of God. Love, pity, and wish well to every soul in the world. Dwell in love, and then you dwell in God. Hate nothing but the evil that stirs in your own heart. Teach your heart this prayer, till your heart continually saith, though not with outward words, O holy Jesus, meek Lamb of God, 
bread that came down from heaven, light and life of all holy souls, help me to a true and living faith in thee. O oh, do thou open thyself within me, with all thy holy nature, spirit, tempers, and inclinations, that I may be born again of thee, and be in thee a new creature, quickened and revived, led and governed by the Holy Spirit. Yours in all Christian affection, W. Law. Letter 2, July 20th. My dear worthy friend, whom I heartily love in the unity of the Spirit of Christ, your long letter I received some time the last month, and read with much pleasure, for, long as it was, I did not wish it to be shorter. I bless God for that good and right spirit which breathed in every part of it. As it required no immediate answer, and you left me to my own time, so I did not intend to write till last week, but, by accidental affairs, have been hindered from complying with my intention till now. Your judgment has failed you in nothing, but in thinking your letter would be disagreeable to me, or that my answer was deferred on that account. Every creature has my love, but persons of your spirit kindle in me every holy affection of honor and esteem towards them. Love, with its fruits of meekness, patience, and humility, is all that I wish for myself and every human creature, for this is to live in God, united to Him, both for time and eternity. Would you have done with error, scruple, and delusion, consider the Deity, as I have said, to be the greatest love, the greatest meekness, the greatest sweetness, the eternal, unchangeable will to be a good and blessing to every creature, and that all the misery, darkness, and death of fallen angels and fallen men consists in their having lost this divine nature. Consider yourself, and all the fallen world, as having nothing to seek or wish for, but, by the spirit of prayer, to draw into the life of your soul rays and sparks of this divine, meek, loving, tender nature of God. Consider the holy Jesus as the gift of God to your soul, to begin and finish the birth of God in heaven within you, in spite of every inward or outward enemy. These three infallible truths, heartily embraced and made the nourishment of your soul, shorten and secure the way to heaven, and leave no room for error, scruple, or delusion. The poverty of our fallen nature, the depraved workings of flesh and blood, the corrupt tempers of our polluted birth in this world, do us no hurt, so long as the spirit of prayer works contrary to them, and longs for the first birth of the light and spirit of heaven. All our natural evil ceases to be our own evil, as soon as our will spirit turns from it. It then changes its nature, loses all its poison and death, and only becomes our holy cross, on which we happily die from self in this world into the kingdom of heaven. I must congratulate you on your manner of prayer. So practiced it becomes the life of the soul, and the true food of eternity. Keep in this state of application to God, and then you will infallibly find it to be the way of rising out of the vanity of time into the riches of eternity. Do not expect or look for the same degrees of sensible fervor. The matter lies not there. Nature will have its share, but the ups and downs of that are to be overlooked. Whilst your will spirit is good and set right, the changes of creaturely fervor lessen not your union with God. It is the abyss of the heart, an unfathomable depth of eternity within us, as much above sensible fervor as heaven is above earth. It is this that works our way to God and unites us with heaven. This abyss of the heart is the divine nature and power within us, which never calls upon God in vain, but, whether helped or deserted by bodily fervor, penetrates through all outward nature, as easily and effectually as our thoughts can leave our bodies and reach into the regions of eternity. I am, with hearty prayers to God for you, your truly affectionate friend and servant, W. Law. Letter 3. My dear L., I am greatly rejoiced at your expressing so feeling a sense of the benefit of prayer, and hope you will every day be more and more raised to and united with God by it. I love no mysterious depths or heights of speculation, covet no knowledge, want to see no ground of nature, grace, and creature, but so far as it brings me nearer to God, 
forces me to forget and renounce everything for him, to do everything in him and for him, and to give every breathing, moving, stirring intention and desire of my heart, soul, spirit, and life to him. It is for the sake of the spirit of prayer that I have endeavored to set so many points of religion in such a view as must dispose the reader, willingly, to give up all that he inherits from his fallen father, to be all hunger and thirst after God, and have no thought or care but how to be wholly his devoted instrument everywhere, and in everything, his adoring, joyful, and thankful servant. When it is the one ruling, never-ceasing desire of our hearts, that God may be the beginning and end, the reason and motive, of our doing or not doing, from morning to night, then everywhere, whether speaking or silent, whether inwardly or outwardly employed, we are equally offered up to the Eternal Spirit, have our life in Him and from Him, and are united to Him by that Spirit of prayer, which is the comfort, the support, the strength, and security of the soul, traveling, by the help of God, through the vanity of time, into the riches of eternity. My dear friend, have eyes shut and ears stopped to everything that is not a step in that ladder that reaches from earth to heaven. Reading is good, hearing is good, conversation and meditation are good, but then they are only good at times and occasions, in a certain degree and must be used and governed with such caution as we eat and drink and refresh ourselves, or they will bring forth in us the fruits of intemperance. But the spirit of prayer is for all times and all occasions. It is a lamp that is to be always burning, a light that is ever shining. Everything calls for it. Everything is to be done in it and governed by it. Because it is and means and wills nothing else but the totality of the soul, not doing this or that, but wholly, incessantly given up to God, to be where and what and how He pleases. The state of absolute resignation, naked faith, and pure love of God is the highest perfection and most purified life of those who are born again from above, and, through the divine power, become sons of God and is neither more nor less than what our blessed Redeemer has called and qualified us to long and aspire after in these words, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Near the conclusions of yours, you say, since your last to me, you have met with a great many trials disagreeable to flesh and blood, but that adhering to God is always your blessed relief. Yet permit me on this occasion, to transcribe a memorandum or two from an old scrap of paper which has long lain by me for my use. Number one, receive every inward and outward trouble, every disappointment, pain, uneasiness, darkness, temptation, and desolation with both thy hands as a true opportunity and blessed occasion of dying to self and entering into a fuller fellowship with thy self-denying, suffering Savior. Number two, look at no inward or outward trouble in any other view, reject every other thought about it, and then every kind of trial and distress will become the blessed day of thy prosperity. Number three, be afraid of seeking or finding comfort in anything but God alone. For that which gives thee comfort takes so much of thy heart from God. Quid est cor purum, cui ex toto, et pure sufficit solus Deus, cui nihil sapit, quod nihil delectat, nisi Deus. That is, what is a pure heart, one to which God alone is totally and purely sufficient, to which nothing relishes or gives delight but God alone. Number four. That state is best which exerciseth the highest faith in and fullest resignation to God. Number five. What is it that you want and seek, but that God may be all in all in you? But how can this be, unless all creaturely good and evil become as nothing in you and to you? O oh, anima mea, abstrahe te ab omnibus, Quid tibi cum mutabilibus creaturis, 
solum sponsum tuum qui omnium est auctor creaturarum expectans hoc age ut cor tuum ille liberum et expeditum semper inveniat quoties ille ad ipsum venire placuerit that is o my soul withdraw thyself from all things what hast thou to do with changeable creatures waiting and expecting thy bridegroom who is the author of all creatures let it be thy only care that he may find thy heart free and disengaged as often as it shall please him to visit thee i thank you for your kind offer about the manuscript and the sale but have no curiosity that way i have had all that i can have from books i leave the rest to god i have formerly given away many of the lives of good armelli so can have no dislike to your doing the same. I have often wished for some or several little things of that kind, though more according to my mind, by which the meanest capacities might, in an easy manner, be led into the heart and spirit of religion. Dear man, adieu. The Angel's Hymn, said to have been sung by the late Rev. W. Law when on his deathbed, thus angels sang and thus sing we to god on high all glory be let him on earth his peace bestow and unto men his favor shew welcome sweet words sweet words indeed in darkness light through them is spied whate'er is needless these we need lord let these words with us abide this day sets forth thy praises, Lord. Our grateful hearts to thee shall sing. Our thankful lips now shall record thine ancient love, eternal King. And let the church with one accord resound, Amen, and praise the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. End of Preface B Recording by Robert Hoffman Latin text recorded by Mr. Martin Giessen.